Thank you very kindly. Good evening, friends. Happy to be here tonight, and so glad that we're all able to be out. Thanking the good Lord for his marvelous services last night. To hear is the first time that I've uh, had the opportunity to get among the people to to um, preach to them like that for a long time and to minister to them. And uh, last evening when going out, the boy said to me, said, they don't like for me to have that type of meeting to go down and lay hands on the people. They just think maybe, they said when it's being called from the platform, it's always 100%. And said, so you're just taking the people's word at it at that. And I said, well, they got faith. They believe. And when I was walking down among the wheelchairs, I thought it was Billy walking in front of me. I happened to turn sideways look. It wasn't Billy. It was him. And then when I got back up, then the Lord began to prophesy and said there'll be some in the wheelchairs that'll walk through the audience, some go out. The boy said, will that take place? I said, you just watch and see. And there, last night, that's right, that's five paralyzed people from the wheelchairs this week. That's marvelous what our Lord is doing. I believe he'll go great more than that tonight. Don't you think so? We believe that he will. Now, tomorrow night, being the closing of this service, you've been so good to us and come out and set in the weather when it was cool and rainy. and uh, You've been very, very nice, and we'll always remember you. And I've had a kind of a little struggle. It's a good thing you was nice because it's not customary that I speak to the people like this or preach and then make the altar calls and so forth. Brother Moore, for some reason, didn't show up. And Brother Argenbright didn't show up. But Brother Tom from South Africa, bless his heart, he was somewhere here. I heard him say amen a while ago. Here he comes back. And that was a, that wouldn't have to be the little boy that was named William Branham. Well, my first time I've seen you, Sonny. You're a fine boy. I'm expecting to see you work at my house pretty soon now. See? Well, that's mighty fine. I know you all enjoy Brother Tom's speaking. You'll probably be at some church here tomorrow. Brother Beeler's sitting here. He'll probably be preaching somewhere in the morning, too. The other boys here, I guess they're lined out for some churches. Now, you that's here and uh, in the service, visitors with us, why, you, you get some good church and go to church in the morning. All these ministers here, they represent these full gospel churches around in Atlanta, or Macon here, and they'll be happy to have you in their church. And uh, I haven't even got to meet any of the brothers, but little brother Palmer here, I might have shook a couple of the hands of the brethren, but if they're all like brother Palmer, they're fine people, I'll tell you that. They're really fine. He's a fine brother. And now we... I hope that tomorrow there's good services all through the, throughout the country. Stand your post of duty tomorrow. Now, tomorrow morning, go to Sunday school. And let's see, I guess tomorrow afternoon the services are here. Is that right? Tomorrow uh, afternoon. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Well, they change it to... Oh. Then the service, you've done announced it, I guess. Oh. The services are here tomorrow night. All right. Now, the Lord be blessed is our sincere prayer. Now... For a subject, just to meditate a little while, and we want to say again, we thank the dear Lord so greatly for all that he has did. Now, I believe that just in any American meeting for this many days, the being five paralyzed people made whole in one single meeting, I believe that's just about as, as great as the Lord has done for us this entire year. And now in Africa or some of the other countries in India or something on that order, it's different. But here in America, because there's many services goes through. And one thing, we never stay ten nights. We're just usually there for anywhere from three to five nights and then go. So I'm just saying that so that you might see and know that I believe you have great faith. And I'm so happy. Many of the people, he said, has been testifying. Brother Woods and them was telling me today of people testifying with 
all kinds of diseases and everything has been healed and several on cot I don't believe we have but one cot here tonight God just cleared out the cot cases and everything isn't that wonderful Amen. And saying by the way last evening while coming on the platform about one of the first come up was um, a pitiful case I've noticed for the last few nights the lady's sitting with a little water-headed baby and that's uh, nothing can be done for that in the way of medical research or so, for uh, scientific research to help it. the little fellows are just totally helpless and a poor little mother so interested packing the little fellow night after night and crying I kept looking over the little thing and I could see what the trouble was and many times visions speak I don't even say nothing about it a fellow just called me on the phone just a few moments ago and I met him in a, a restaurant the other night and there the Lord told me what was wrong with him he called me up and he said you know since you I've seen you said I've just got a whole lot better I told him what was wrong with him he liked to faint <laughs> and so he, uh, that's it you just have to watch you see it's going to happen anyhow so it, it isn't so much whether they know anything about it as long as you know it between uh, God has said it's going to be alright so that that settles it you see it isn't the idea if we want the people to know it as long as God says it. Well, amen, just let it go. And if you think a little encouragement would help them, then you usually say something. But this little baby come across the platform, great big waterhead, leaning over a poor little tired mother. And as I laid hands on that child, I seen that light whirl right around the child's head. And I, I knew something was going to happen. So I asked the mother if she would take the baby home and knew that something happened to it then if I'd had something to prove it to the mother. But I told her, I said, you take the baby home. And she lived out of town, I believe it told her, somewhere about 100 miles. She travels about 200 miles a night to bring the baby. And when she got home, I said, put a little string right around its head and measure the string. And then cut that string off. And then put the string right around again the next night, tomorrow night, and bring me the piece of string now, how much that baby's head shrunk, and, tw and uh, it's be about 18 hours or 20. And here's a string, about an inch and a half of string, the baby's head shrunk within about 18 hours. I wonder if the mother's here or anywhere with the baby tonight. With, oh, she's already right. Here's the mother here. That's right. All right. God bless you, sister. Now, the reason I did that, sister, was this, that you might be encouraged. I have prayed for many things that I, I, I didn't get. But I don't believe as before our Maker tonight. Ever sincerely I ask God for anything sincerely like that, unless He give it to me or told me why He couldn't. See? Now, that inch and a half of that little, that baby's head has shrunk within about 18 or 20 hours. That's to encourage you. See? Now, just keep on believing. See? Now, it'll, it'll do that way for about 72 hours. Then you'll notice you keep cutting your string off. It'll stop. It may get worse for a little while. No matter what happens, you just keep on believing, you see. And as long as you'll keep your faith. Now, remember, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a person, it walks in dry places and returns back again with seven other spirits worse than it was. And if it can, it'll enter in and take over, and the condition will be much worse. But if the good man of the house isn't there, which is your faith, to keep it away, just don't fight at it. It'll fight you back. Just refuse. Just ignore it. That's all. Just go on. Just say it's over. That settles it for good. And your baby will get all right. Now the Lord bless you. Now tonight, uh, just love the Word. Don't you love the Word? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the Word. I just want to read just a little uh, text here tonight for a little context. And we want to read it out of Exodus, the fourth chapter, if the Lord willing. And beginning with the second verse, we'll read perhaps the second verse and maybe part of the third. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before him. And the Lord said unto Moses, uh, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it by the tail, and it was a rod in his hand. Now, shall we 
bow our heads just a moment for a word of prayer while we talk to the author of this and then pray for these handkerchiefs here. Our kind Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be gathered here again tonight under the canopies of this sky to look up to the heavens from whence cometh our help, our help cometh from the Lord. We're so glad to know that He lives and reigns today and has not left His church without a witness of His resurrection. And we're so thankful tonight that we, as the children of Israel, we're going to speak of, if it be thy will, in a few moments, how they passed by under their burdens and looked into the casket of Joseph and saw those bones laying there, knowing that God had promised through the prophet that someday they were going out. And tonight, as the antitype of Joseph, the Prince of Prosperity, the Lord Jesus, rose from the dead and is alive tonight here among us as a divine evidence that someday we're going out, out of this world of trouble and sin and where Satan and all of his powers is at, and we'll be free from him forever. Now, Lord, as we meditate on these words, may the Holy Spirit come get into the Word, and may it divide it to every heart, just as we have need tonight. And may we say like those who came from Emmaus when he broke the bread and done something a little different than what the ordinary uh, minister did in that day. He did it in a way that he alone could do it. And, Father, we pray tonight that he'll do something out of the ordinary that we don't see every day in every religious service, just that people might know that that same Lord Jesus is alive from the dead tonight, walking in and around among people, doing the same things he did then. Grant it, Father. These handkerchiefs that lay here, they're representing poor little sick children, fathers, mothers. Many people laying out suffering because of diseases and oppression of the devil. And, Father, with hands laid upon them with prayer, all my heart, I pray that you'll hear me, Lord, and know the integrity of my heart as we rebuke ever unclean spirit, ever demon power that binds the people these handkerchiefs to be laid upon. And when these handkerchiefs are placed upon them, may they be liberated, Lord, and go on their way rejoicing, and Satan be bound and cast into outer darkness. Grant it, Father. Help us now in the farther part of the service, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we meditate just a few moments here on the Word of the Lord, I trust that everybody will just I'll try to hurry so I know the wind blowing a little cool and on sick people, and I'll try to hurry. And maybe tomorrow night it'll be a little warmer. We'll stay just a little longer. The other day going out looking up, Mr. Woods and I were riding down the road, and I seen those poor farmers and their corn just rolled up. I used to farm a little too. And the watermelons and everything, the cotton drying up. I went home and I said, Dear God, I know we got an open-air service, but please send those people some rain because they're really needing rain. And I just thought of the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus, how He let it rain up to the service, stop while we had the service, and then give them a good drenching last night, clear it up for the night. Oh, my, how marvelous He is. He knows just how to do it, doesn't He? And we just love Him so much for that. He's just worthy of all praise. Now tonight, I want to speak just for a few moments on the subject of what is that in thy hand. Now, uh, our context tonight deals with Moses, a man that was used of God back to deliver the children of Israel out from under the Egyptian bondage. And many peoples tonight of God is under bondage. I look sitting here, a mother with a little boy. Looks like maybe his, his little legs might be uh, deformed or something. He's laying close to his mother. A little fellow sitting here in a wheelchair. A little child perhaps has had polio or something. His little leg is all uh, bandaged up with braces. I notice a young girl sitting here, a beautiful little lady, just looked like in her teenage yet, and a poor old dad twisted up in a wheelchair, just like that. That's bondage. Satan's done that. Here's a colored brother sitting here. Someone sitting near him, holding him, and, or near him. And just look at the bondage that Satan has put the people in. 
And God is just as loves you just the same as He loved those Hebrews. And when God sent Moses down there because He had promised that He would come and liberate them out of that bondage. And God has promised in this last day that He would send Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in our midst and would liberate all the sick and afflicted. For it is written, the last words that He said before leaving this earth, He said, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. How far? The apostles' age? To all the world. The gospel has never reached all the world yet. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be saved. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, or drink deadly things that wouldn't harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's what the Bible said. Jesus received up into heaven. The last commission he ever gave the church was heal the sick. The first commission he ever gave the church was heal the sick. He chose his seventy and his twelve and sent them out and gave them power against unclean spirits to cast out devils and to heal the sick. The first commission. The last commission was go into all the world and heal the sick. On that scripture, I know by many theologians, it's disgusted and said among them that that Mark 16 where I was quoting from, from the ninth verse on, was not inspired. Reminds me, I don't believe the pulpit is any place to joke. I don't believe in jokes. Keep the pulpit clean. Jokes was there out there. But this was just a little quotation which was true. And it sounds like it might be a joke, but it wasn't. There was a little fella in our part of the country that uh, had a calling to the ministry. His mother was a very fine old lady, and she uh, sent him away to a seminary to become a minister. And while he was away why, to the college and seminary, learning how to preach and so forth, well, uh, the, his mother taken sick, very sick. She had pneumonia. And they called the doctor, and he gave her, of course, all that he could give her. And um, she couldn't take penicillin. She's allergic to it. So he was giving herself a drug and a, some more things. And it just wouldn't take a hold. The woman, her lungs were becoming completely congested, and she was in very bad shape. So they telegrammed her son and told him to stand by for they thought his mother would die right away and they had to want him to come home. He was many miles away. But um, all at once, why, there's a little lady lived down the corner, belonged to a full gospel mission that lived around the corner, that believed in divine healing. So she went up to see the old lady and she said, um, Sister, she said, uh, our pastor believes and we down at our church that Jesus died to heal the sick people. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, won't you let our pastor come up and pray for you? Maybe God would answer his prayer and heal you. She said, that'd be very nice. Send him up. So the woman, the man come up and he prayed for her and she got well. About a year later, her son came home and they were discussing things after a meeting. He said, Mother, by the way, he said, I never did hear just what the doctor gave you. That you got well so quick when you had the pneumonia when I was standing by to come. She said, oh, son, she said, I forgot to tell you. She said, you know where that little mission is down on the corner down there? And said, yes. Said, you know, that lady come up here and told me to have her pastor come up and pray for me. And said, you know, he come up and read a piece out of the Bible and the Mark, the 16th chapter, and said, they lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know, the Lord heal me right away. Why, she said, the boy said, now listen, mother. Said, now those people are illiterate. Said, see, they don't understand. Said, we, said, uh, there's no such a thing as divine healing. Said, there's nothing like that in the Bible. Said, that was in the days gone by. So now in the seminary, while we learn that Mark 16 from the ninth verse on is not inspired, the little mother said, well, hallelujah. And he said, mother, why, he said, you act like those people. And she said, well, glory to God. He said, well, Mother, what's the matter with you? He said, I was just a thinking. If the Lord could heal me with uninspired word, what could he really do with that? It was really inspired. And that part's inspired. So that's right. I believe it's all inspired, every bit of it. And it's all for us. Every bit is for us. We have no need and lack of anything. God has provided everything that we have need of in this journey is provided for us right here. However, whenever a man's born again of the Spirit of God, the Lord gives him a checkbook 
to enough to do him through his journey, and every bar of the check for any redemptive blessing is signed Jesus' name. Just fill it out and send it in. See if he won't honor it. <laughs> That's right. Just, just send it there. He is the deposits. It's already in there. It was deposited at Calvary, for he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace up on him, and with his stripes we were healed. All signed in his blood. It's all over. And he, whosoever will, let him come. And it's been proven. It's proven here that he's risen from the dead and he's alive among us tonight. He is the liberator of we who are in bondage. Any person that's in bondage, Jesus Christ is here to liberate them this night, if you'll believe it. Now, I'm not here to liberate you because he couldn't do it. I wasn't sent to do it. I was sent to preach the gospel. That's all. Christ come to liberate. Now, Moses, when he was just a born baby, just there was a great threat in Egypt and was killing all the male children. And right in that time, Moses was born, and the mother, seeing him to be a fair child, wasn't afraid of a Pharaoh's threat of what he was doing with all the children. Now, if you'll see, friends, to begin with, I want you to get this real close. To begin with, that gifts and callings are without repentance. That's what causes the trouble, see? Don't try to impersonate anything. Just be what you are in the kingdom of God. If your finger be a finger, if your nose be a nose, eye be an eye. I hope my finger never decides not to be a finger because it's not an eye. It'll certainly put me out of operation for a while. So that's the way we must all get our positions and move on. But the whole group together is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what it is. Now, show that gifts and callings are without repentance. Look at Jesus. He was the woman's seed from the Garden of Eden. He was born the Son of God. Moses. He was a fair child when he was born and born to be a deliverer. He couldn't help being a prophet. God made him at his birth. Look at uh, John the Baptist, 712 years before he was born. He is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, 4, I believe. God told Jeremiah, said, I knew you and, and sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations before you was even conceived in your mother's womb. Now, you have to believe in predestination and foreordination. You just, it's there. Gifts and callings are without repentance. That's what God has set in the church. A different a little bit with my latter lane brethren there. On that of laying hands and ministering spiritual gifts. I believe you got that wrong. See, that's all right. We don't fall out over it, but uh, I believe you're wrong on there. See, Paul and Timothy, they recognize that to be Timothy to be a minister and a gifted man. We do the same thing at the Baptist church and all the rest of them when we see a man like that to lay hands on him, but not to give him a spiritual gift, but to give him the right hand of fellowship and blessing to minister with the gift that God has given him. <laughs> that's just the difference, you see. And so if you try to give him a gift, that's what man does, see, and it'll never work. It sure hasn't been successful, and I don't think it ever will. Now, but when God has did anything, it's different. Moses realized that he was Moses. God, how he preserved him and taken care of him. And then, when he become age, he thought the people would surely understand, be spiritual-minded to understand. Now, there's a point that I wish we had time. It wasn't so chilly to dwell on just for a few moments. The people fail to understand very much. And when he slew the Egyptian, thinking that people would understand his own people, that he was sent to liberate them, but they did not understand. Now... We find out then that he fled into the land of Midia, and there he married an Ethiopian girl by the name of Zipporah. Moses, in the beginning, had a real high temper. We know that. God had to take it out of him. So then we, he married this girl, and he became a servant to his father-in-law, herding the sheep back out the backside of the desert. One day I can just imagine seeing this old man now of 80 years old. He had two children born to him up there, and... Here he comes down now, um, herding the sheep, just a sheep herder, a man out, got out of the will of God and murdered a man and back over there now as a sheep herder. But if God has foreordained anything, it's just as sure to come to pass as God is in heaven. So it's going to be anyhow. There's nothing in the world can stop Jesus Christ from coming the second time. God has ordained it to be so. There's not a way in the world that you'd ever stop the message of divine healing. You could fight it as much as you want to, but God's ordained that it should go forth, and it's going forth. That's right. No matter. Somebody, God's able to these stones to rise children unto Abraham. 
So the best thing to do is join up with God's program and march on with the church. It's the best thing I know to do. Here some time ago, I was up in the Statue of Liberty and went out in that arm. And looking out there over that window, seeing a bunch of little sparrows that was dead laying all around o- over the outside there. And I said to the guide, I said, Say, what's the matter? Those little sparrows are, are dead. He said, Sir, there was a storm last night. And those little fellows circling around, and got into the light of this Statue of Liberty here. And instead of following the light to safety, they come and beat their little brains out trying to beat the light out. The only thing that could help them is trying to beat it out and kill themselves in effort. I said, Praise God, there may be infidels, raisin, common, whatever more, skeptics and unbelievers, but more you beat the light out, trying to beat the light of God, you'll just beat yourself to death and fall down in disgrace, and the light of God will shine on through the ages. That's right. God will move on in spite of anything anybody can do. The best thing to do is join right up with Him and move right on with the, with the flow of the Holy Spirit. And Moses, when he was back out there on the backside of the desert one day, I imagine kind of discouraged, walking along, thinking about what had taken place down in Egypt and all of his friends. And here he was married into another uh, uh, race of people and herding his father-in-law's sheep. He happened to look over there and he saw a bush on fire. And he thought it was funny that the bush never burned. So God was trying to attract Moses' attention. And how do I know? What do you know? But what this meeting out here has been the... God has set it out here to attract the attention of some of you people that's living in these churches around here without knowing that God raised from the dead and Jesus is alive here tonight healing the sick and the afflicted. Maybe He brought you out here to see these lame and crippled and twisted people rise up out of their wheelchairs and walk away to see His Spirit move through the audience and correct people and rebuke sinners here at the platform, saintly, godly-looking people come and tell them where they're sinning and the things are, and every word of it's infallibly the truth. Amen. How do you know Amen. that God hasn't attracted your attention to come and look at something like that so that you would have turned aside also? Not turn from your church, but turn from your way of living and serve the living God in the new birth and be born again. Maybe God's doing that. Moses turned aside, and as he looked at that burning bush, he started to allow, go up and see what this sight is. Usually God reveals himself in fire. So he turned aside to see it, and God spoke to him out of the bush and said, Moses, take off your shoes for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. Now what if Moses would have said, Now, Lord, I'm just going to be reverent to you. I'm going to take off my hat. That'll be just as well. God never said your hat. He said your shoes. My pa said, well, I join church, ain't I just as good as the next fellow? God never said if a man don't join the church, he said a man must be born again if he doesn't. Amen. Say, well, I, I go to a good church, that's all right, but that ain't the requirement. Except a man be born of water and spirit, he will in no wise enter into the kingdom. God's got one solid program, no matter how good anything else looks, you've got to line up with God's gospel. The Bible says it. Amen. That's the thing we've got to do. And Moses had to line up with God's program. Not what Moses thought was reverence, but what God called reverence. And he slipped down, took off his shoes and walked up. He said, I have heard the cries of my people and I've come down and I am going to send you down to deliver them. You know, Moses complained. He said, now look, I'm a man of slow speech. I can't talk very good and I'm not eloquent and so forth. He began to complain and God told him he'd send Aaron. And then he wanted to know, he said, if he could see his glory, what would he tell him to done? And God said to Moses, what is that in your hand? Now, whatever was laying close, God could have used anything. God could have used the bush. But Moses had something in his hand. He said, it's a stick. He said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it down. And when he did, it turned to a serpent. He picked it up with a tail. It turned back to a rod again. And God showed Moses by that what he could do, that he was still the living God. He could take the natural and change it into supernatural. He could do whatever he wanted to because he was God. Moses picked up that stick in his hand, run over and got Zippor with his wife and set her on a mule and put a kid on each hip and got an old donkey by the bridle and the stick in his hand. And here he went down to Egypt to liberate a two million people. Could you imagine it? What a critical-looking sight that would be. 
This old man, 80 years old, a white beard and hair blowing like that, just a happy and a shouting, hollering, glory to God. His wife sat him straddle this mule with a kid on each hip going down to take over. <laughs> Could you imagine that? What do you think the great armies and soldiers would have said that day? Well, that old poor old fellow's went off at the head. The world always thinks that, but he had the word of the Lord, and it had to come to pass. He had God's promise. And he had that old stick in his hand away. But now a dry stick going against the great army of Egypt, which had conquered the world in its days. Thousands times thousands of chariots, horsemen, spearmen, the greatest mechanized units, just like one single man would try to go against Russia today or something like that. Maybe a greater odds would be then. And Moses, 80 years old, I imagine bald-headed on top and the whiskers hanging down and the hair around his neck. And, and there he was leading this mule going down to take over. And the beauty part about it, he did it. That's right. Amen. Because that God had made the promise. When God promises anything, God's under obligation to take care of his promise. God always will back it up. I don't care what God, what anybody says about it. When God says it's so, it's so. Rest your soul, body, and strength on it because God's obligated to His Word. Amen. I'm so thankful for that little song we sang. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I'm trusting in His love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. It's the whosoever will may come. And drank from the fountain of the waters of the Lord freely, without money, without price. It's done already, paid for. Anybody can come and drink. Moses going down to take over. What a sight that was. And when he got down there, he took this old stick, the only thing he had in his hand, and overcome Egypt and led the children of Israel and fed them by the same stick till they went to the promised land. Amen. An old dry stick. They might not have very much in your hand. You might not even be able to whistle, but whatever you got in your hand, let God have a hold of it and He'll bless it. Amen. If you can't do no more, testify to your neighbor. If you can't do no more, raise up your hand and say, God, I accept every word of it. Take what's in your hand and do what you can for the glory of God. There's a little boy one time went to see Jesus, and he had four or five little biscuits and some fish in there. Now in the little boy's hand, it wasn't very much. But once in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, he blessed it and fed 5,000. The little thing that you got may be a little spark of faith laying down there that you believe that he raised from the dead. It isn't very much to you, but turn it loose one time in a testimony. It might be the cause of hundreds of people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're sitting there sick or crippled and you got a little speck of faith, turn it loose tonight and say, Lord Jesus, this is all I've got to trust your word and here I come. It's up to you to take care of the rest of it. God will do the rest of it too. You just turn it loose and let him have it. What kind of an Adam did Jesus turn loose then? He taken fish. Not only did he feed him with raw fish or living fish, he fed him with cooked fish and cooked bread. Amen. Where he got it, I don't know. Anyhow, he, he fed him and they eat it. Like a fellow said not long ago, said, you believe that story about Elijah sitting up there in the crows? I said, yes, sir, I believe every word of it. That's right. They thought Elijah was crazy, sitting up on the mountain there, and he would get a drink of water whenever he wanted, and then society and high class down there were starving to death. And then he called him crazy. And he was better off than a lot of people. He had some colored servants that carried him food every time he got hungry. That's better off than a lot of the people sitting here tonight. That's right. Every time he got hungry, here come a crow with a sandwich. You give it to him, flew away. Knelt right down and got him a drink of water when he wanted. He was in the will of God. He took God at his word. Amen. That's all you have to do is take his word. Someone said, now, Brother Branham, you really mean that crow brought him a sandwich? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, where did the crow get it? I said, I don't know. The crow got it and brought it to Elijah, and he eat it. I said, that's where the Holy Ghost. She was making fun of me shouting. I said, I can't tell you where it comes from. The Holy Ghost brings it. I just eat it, and I love it, and I live by it. I don't know where it comes from, but I get it. That's the only thing I know. As long as he brings it, I'm willing to take it. Amen. Say, how's that fellow go to walk when he comes to the doctor? I can't help that. When God says so, he'll do it anyhow. You just want It's God's business to take care of his word. He watches over to perform it. And he's obligated to it. And he'll do it in every case. Amen. For any man or woman that will dare to take him at his word. Amen. Oh, my. That's the truth. Yes, sir. Moses went down there and he did just exactly what the Lord told him to do. If you just take what you've got in your hand and let God have it. Now, 
There was a little fellow one time, a little later on from there, by the name of, of David, a little old shepherd boy that lived out on the hillside, feeding his father's sheep. But he knew the blessing of the Lord was upon him, so he knew that God was with him. And one day when the armies of Israel had gathered out to fight against the Philistines, why, his father Jesse said, Now I'm going to send you over to your brothers. Take them some raisins and so forth. And go over and see how your brothers are getting along. Two of the oldest boys was in the war. So David went out. And you know, when he got over there, he saw a sight. The Philistines was gathered on one side and Israel on the other. Saul sitting over there, seven foot, four inches tall or something. Great big priestly looking fellow. But across over on the other side of the holler, over there was the Philistine army, and they had a big challenger, a big champion by the name of Goliath. My, he was about nine foot four inches tall, and what a fellow he was. And when the devil knows he's got the edge on you, then he'll sure poke it in you if he possibly can. So he got out on the hillside there, and he said, I'll make you a proposition, all you fellows. Let's not cause any bloodshed. See, he's big, and he had the edge on all of them. So he said... You stand to pick you out a man over there in the armies of Israel and let him come over here and fight against me. And if I kill him, then you all serve us. If he kills me, then we'll serve you. Sure. That's the way the devil will do it. Now, you take, for instance, this guy here. If I could only see this or that or that. See, whenever they can get that kind of an idea. But one day he made his brag in the wrong man's ear. There's a little old scrawny looking fellow, probably weighed about 110 pounds. With the shoulders kind of stooped over and a little shepherd's coat wrapped around him. And that morning when the army's walking back and forth and screaming at one another and trying to get into the battle, while this big challenger come out and said, No, I defy the armies of Israel. But it fell on the ears of the wrong man for him then. Yes, sir, there was a little old boy there that knew what he's talking about. He said, What's this? You mean to tell me that you'll stand and let uh, that uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? Amen. He knew what he was talking about. Oh, my. Glad you made your wrong bow stand. <laughs> and when that fell on David's ear, then his brother said, Now, looky here. I know the naughtiness of your heart. Now, you just put saying such things as that. Some of them said, Why, he can marry the king's daughter, and he'll give him riches, and his father's house will be free in Israel, and so forth. He said, What's this you all talking about now? My, this little bitty old fellow. That's just the way you... Well, you can't go by looks. That's right. You don't go by looks. You go by what's in the heart. Amen. That's right. If you go by looks, why, Israel would have had an awful time when they thought they could get water out of a rock. That's the driest place it was in the nation. But God said, speak to the rock. That's the thing got the water. And then they say today, if there is such a thing as divine healing, it would be in some of those great big classical churches. That's just what you think about it, see? That's right. Maybe it's Amen. the driest place you've ever seen, but there's water there if you just speak to it. Amen. Now, I want you to notice, then when David, I can just see him, walk up there and he said, brought him up before the king. said, now wait a minute here. So bring that lad up here. He walked up to him. The day Saul called him a stripper. He must have been a little bitty old skinny looking fellow, you know. Little shoulders set in, kind of walking along. Little old startled eyes looking out to him. He said, well, listen, you can't fight that. He said, let no man's heart faint within him because of this giant. He said, your servant will go over and find him. Oh, my. I like that courage, don't you? Why? We'll see in a minute why he had that courage. What made that difference? Yes, sir. He said, I'll go over and fight that giant. And there Saul, the great big baby sitting up there, pretty as big as a giant, and supposed to be a king in Israel and all of this, and then sat there afraid to go fight him. Puts me in the mind of a lot of these people today that don't believe in divine healing. They claim to believe the Bible, and then they just let the devil walk over them anything. I believe in an old-fashioned, Holy Ghost experience, born again, rooted down, twice dead. I, I believe in something that makes a man alive, that puts courage and fire in him. That's right, that'll make him stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil on any divine promise of God and call it the truth, no matter what it looks like. Little old David, why, well, said, you can't do it. He said, you let me go. He said, now, how do you know that you can do it? He said, look here, I'm going to tell you something. I've had some experience. That's what it takes today is somebody's had an experience. 
David said, I've had an experience that I was keeping my father's sheep out there and a lion come in, the bear come in and grabbed the kid or little lamb and run out with it and said, I run at him and knocked him in the head with this slingshot. And then when I started to take the lamb out of his mouth, he rose up and I slew him. He said, the God that delivered the lion into my hands and the bear into my hands, he said, how much more will he deliver that uncircumcised Philistine? That's right. So Saul said, come over here and I'll make a real ecclesiastical preacher out of you then. So he gets him over there and he puts on a big armor and his helmet and everything. He pulled down over his little ears. And imagine peeping out the side and a great big armor on. And he couldn't move. He just couldn't go forward. That's what's the matter with people today. When a man gets a little call in his heart to go preach the gospel, you have to take him over to one of these big seminaries or something and beat all the preacher out of him and get some this worldly theology in him like that and take all the oh, preacher there is out of him. him. Then for him to go. No wonder he can't believe. My goodness, all harnessed up with the world. Hallelujah! We need to come out and shake some old-fashioned Holy Spirit down and get these old morgues melted down. What we need around here. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Old David there, he put on his... He had his B.A. degree, you know, and his, his L.L. and double L.D. and D.D., you know, all along. He said, I don't know anything about this stuff. <laughs> I never proved anything. I don't know what that is. So I can't do that. And Saul found out pretty soon that his ecclesiastical vest didn't fit a man of God. <laughs> Amen. That's what's the matter with the people today. If you just get them old ecclesiastical vests off and get down. I'd rather have an old experience. I'd rather my boy would get with a man that didn't know his ABCs and take him out here on a hillside by an old stump somewhere and pray him through to an old-fashioned Holy Ghost experience. Amen. And the same to all the schools there is in the country that would take the power of God and the blessings of God out of his life. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Right. Yes, sir. And there David looked up on her thing and said, I don't know anything about this. I don't know how to say, Amen, oh, and all the doxologies and all them things like that. I don't know how you do that. So let me go with what I have already proven to be right. Amen. Hallelujah! Right. That's what I said. I know when I walked up to my general overseer, told him the angel of the Lord had met me, he said, Billy, go home. You had a nightmare. <laughs> He said, why, you mean a seventh grade education, you go to pray for sick and go to pray for kings? I said, that's what he said. He said, how are you going to do it? I said, I don't know, but it's taken me this far. He'll take me on. Amen. God is able who's made the promise. He'll do it. He said, oh, son, I think you better go back. You need to rest. <laughs> I didn't need a rest. I need to go to work. I've been resting too long then. That's what's the matter with a lot of people today. Be up and going. It's time. People are in trouble. Let's go. Get them to the Lord Jesus quickly. We notice there that we find little old David saying, Look, I don't know anything about your, all your degrees, and I don't know nothing about your armors and all the things that you fellows fight with and argue about and fuss with, but I know one thing. I have trusted this little old slingshot. God delivered the lion with this slingshot. He delivered all these other things with this slingshot, and God will deliver that uncircumcised Philistine with slingshot. I know that when I was a sinner lost, and in the world, dying without Christ, the Holy Ghost saved me. I know when I'm weary, the Holy Ghost makes me happy. I know when I need food, the Holy Ghost feeds me. How much more will the Holy Ghost heal me if I'm sick? After God has promised me. I don't know about your other things, but I do know God has made a promise. And it's God's promise, and God will stick with His promise. What's that in your hand, David? He said, a slingshot. <laughs> Amen. How are you going to fight that? John out there with a 50 or 20 foot spear you couldn't get near him. He said, I proved this. I know what this thing will do. That's right. Whoever a man or woman is born to the Spirit of God has ever received the Holy Ghost, they know what that will do. I don't know what all your arguing and all your schools is going to teach, but I know one thing, that it will do what God said it would do. Little David had learned God in the nature way. Being out there long, he talked about still waters and green pastures. He seen God in his primitive condition. God in His nature moving. God is in nature. Don't you believe it? Yeah. Sure He is. I just love to watch Him in the sunset. Watch Him in, as the growing of the flowers. Watch Him when the sun's arising. Here some time ago, I was up in the mountains where I go when it gets so tired, I can't go along any farther. And I went up there one fall to hunt. Now I was hunting elk. It was late in the fall. We was way back up because the snow hadn't come down to run the herd down. And I was way up top near the timber line. And then the fall of the year, way up there in the high mountains, it comes, it'll snow a while, and then rain a while, and then the sun come out. You know how it is in the fall of the year. And I was 
going along not to shoot the game no more than just to be away to myself. I like to get away with God. Every man and woman, that's the trouble. You ought to spend more time every day instead of getting about and running around. You ought to be out somewhere praying and Amen. seeking God. Amen. And up there, I was going along, and it come up a storm, and I got in behind a tree like this, and I was standing behind the tree, and the winds are blowing. There's old blow down there anyhow. So then, after the storm was all over, I come out behind the tree, had my rifle setting down. I looked over. And I began to hear the elk herd way ahead of me. They got lost in the storm. They were bugling one to another. My mother's a half Indian. And uh, just enough that I just love that outside. Oh, my. As David said, when the deep begins to call to the deep. And it really began to call to the deep. Then old gray wolf began to howl up here and the mate answering down at the bottom. I cried like a baby. I couldn't help it. Just stand there and bawl with my hands up in the air. I looked out then. The sun come out. Way back over here in the western horizon, peeping through that big old Sinai, and over that evergreen, it throws over up there with the ice that formed a rainbow down across the valley like that. I thought, oh God, everywhere you look, you can see him. There he was, I thought. He, there he's looking over there. He's looking through. There he's in the elk herd, and here he is down in the wolves of Holland. Here he is in nature. I thought, like Peter said, it's good to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. And I got real religious. And I run around and around that tree, uh, shouting to the top of my voice, just screaming and jumping up and down just as hard as I could. If somebody come out there, they'd want to take me to the insane institution, think there's somebody crazy out in the woods. But I was about 35 or 40 miles from civilization. I was alone with the Lord, having a good time. I looked up and I seen that and I thought, yeah, that rainbow, God gave that to Noah. He used to look up on like the rainbow, jasper and star stone, the first, the last, the he that was, which is, and shall come, root and offspring of David, the morning star. And around and around the tree I went again, just as hard as I could go, just a screaming to the top of my voice. And a little old pine squirrel, I don't know where you brothers ever seen one or not, but a little old pine squirrel was sitting up there on a stump. He started chap, 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 chatter, 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 like he was going to tear me to pieces. Oh, what's the little fellow so excited about? He's just chattering so. And I looked over there and I thought, maybe he's scared of me. And so I have to look and coming out from there, the wind had, had forced down a big eagle. And that big eagle, when he come out, that's what the little squirrel was barking at. He jumped out on a limb like that. And the little squirrel jumped back in his chatter, chatter. I looked at that big eagle. I thought, now, Lord, did I scare that eagle out of there? I was shouting so loud. So I looked at him. And I thought, now, you put him here before me to see for something. I don't know why that you presented that eagle before me. I kept looking at him. Oh, he's a big, great, big bird. And I noticed his great, big, velvet-looking eyes looking around. I thought, well, there's one thing I do admire of you, boy. That is, you're brave. You're not scared. And I thought, why ain't you scared? That's what I want to know. Why are you not scared? Ain't you scared of me? And I looked at him, you know, and he fluffed them feathers back and forth, you know, and Walked back and forth on that log, looking around. He looked at that pine squirrel and looked at me. I said, boy, you know I can shoot you? He just looked over at me and went on, you know, tramping back and forth. He wasn't bothering him much. And I thought, why is it that you're, that you're not scared? Then I happened to say, now I'm going to study, Lord. Why is it? Now I see you there in the rainbow. I was hearing the wolf herd. I see you there in the sunset. Why are you in that eagle? And I looked at that fellow a little bit. I thought, yes. The reason he's not scared, he, he's moving them feathers back and forth. God gave him a pair of wings. And he knows that before I could get that rifle in my hand, he'd be in them treetops and I'd never be able to shoot him. I said, glory to God, I had another spell. Here I started running. I thought, that's right. As long as you can feel the Holy Ghost around you, what difference, what takes place, let everything go, whatever may. As long as you can feel it around you, know he's here. Someone said, Brother Brandon, aren't you afraid you'll make a mistake some night? I said, no, not as long as I can feel him. <laughs> no, sir. When he leaves, I'll leave the platform. But as long as he's there. I watched that fellow for a few minutes. Uh, just getting on my subject here, but I want to tell you this. When I watched him there a little bit, after a while he got tired listening to that little old pine squirrel chatter, 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 chatter. And he just made one great big leap like that. He was right up in above them treetops, a couple of flops with his wings, and he never flopped his wings another time. He just knowed how to set his wings. And I watched him. Every time the wind would come in, he'd ride up. Every time the wind would come in, he'd ride up. Just kept on going on and on and on and on until he become a little speck. I stood there and screamed to the top of my voice. I said, yes, Lord, that's it, that's it. 
It's not jump and join the Methodists and back to the Baptists and over to the Presbyterian and over to the Pentecostal assemblies, oneness, all around like that. It's just setting your wings. Hallelujah. That's right. It's not running from one healing meeting to another. It's not running from one doctor's office to another. And it's knowing how to set your wings of faith into the power of the Holy Ghost. Every time it rides in, right up. Oh, hallelujah. Until you um, leave this old earthbound chatter, chatter, chatter. This old bunch that says the days of miracles is passing. That was for people long ago. Right up above it. Every time the Holy Ghost waves in, catch your wings into it. You move on out of sight. Oh up into the heavens of heaven. Leave that old earth bound so and so set back here and saying, well, I believe the days of miracles is past. I believe those people are just off at the head It thinks that just riding on above it. Amen. Don't flop and jump. Just set your wings. Let the Holy Ghost pick you up. Pick you up. Pick you up. Just keep on going till you're out. Yeah, one day up there I was herding cattle. I happened to notice nothing about e- another thing about an eagle. An old mother eagle, when she makes her nest, she makes it out of big sticks and things and stinky around one. So when the little eagles learns to fly, I was noticing I hooked, put my horse reins around a limb, went over and I had some binoculars just to watch him. I seen that old mother eagle way up there. She was doing something flopping around the air. I got my glasses on her and watched her because we was bringing cattle down. And I looked up in there and I seen her how she was getting them little ones out. And she kept rooting them little old eagles around and around up there. And after a while, she got them all on her wings. And she just picked them up out of that old stinky nest and went down into the valley. And she set her big wings down like that. And when she did, all those little eagles got off. And began to walk around there. First time they'd ever had their feet on grass. My, if they wasn't having a big time, I said, Lord, if that ain't an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival, I've never seen one in my life. <laughs> That's right. I said, look at them. Out of that old stinky nest up there, you know, where the old stinking stickers and things. That's the way God does. He lifts you up on the wings of an eagle and packs you out of the old stinky things of the world into this place where all things are possible, free as you can be. Amen. Then I noticed him run around, grab a little mouthful of grass here, and run over and grab a little mouthful here and playing, just having a big time. No condemnation at all. I thought, now what that old mother go to do? After she seen her little ones begin to play real good and have a good time, she set her wings again and she went plumb way up to the highest rocket she could get. She sat up there and perched herself, began to look around. Oh my, I thought that's right. When the Lord Jesus took me out of the miry clay and set me on the rock Christ Jesus, he climbed the right parts of glory, setting on high, watching down. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. No harm, no danger, no nothing else can take place as long as we're in his divine presence. Amen. Let come, let go what may even death itself has well as it seen. Because he's standing honor in glory tonight. His eyes is watching this meeting to see just exactly what will take place while his little ones are rallying together around the throne of God, rejoicing in the word of God, shouting in the presence of God. Oh, my! Carefree! Them little fellows didn't look for nothing. Boy, you let a coyote start towards one of them, he'd get the awfully flogging he ever had in his life. <laughs> Amen! Oh, my! And once she sat up there, then after a while, I sat there about two hours watching her. A little northerner come across, a little green streak comes up quick, the storm's coming. And when she let out a scream, when she left that nest up there, she flew right down like that, let out one scream, and all them little eagles all over the... The little meadow there began to run together. She threw out her wings like that. Every one of them little eagles just running, jumped up on the wing, put their little feel around a feather like that. She raised those great big master wings. And that storm coming down that hill, screaming 60 miles an hour, she went just as straight to the rock as she could and took them to shelter. I thought, yes, some of these days I'll come a scream from a pub. The Lord Jesus will come and spread forth his great wings. And all these little ones will swing on to the arms of the old rugged cross, and we'll be carried into the safety of this coming day. Till the storm of life is over. Oh, what a wonder if you look at God and His nature. David had seen this, and he knew that God was, and God would deliver. He'd seen God in His nature. So he said, give me this little slingshot. I've tried it. That's the only thing I know anything about is this slingshot. And that's all a believer knows anything about it. God said so, and this is the old slingshot. I'll trust it any time against anything that the devil can put out. 
Amen. Is the Word of God. The Word of God alone will defeat Satan any place, any time, on any conditions. If a man or woman will dare to take it, God at His Word. Amen. And I can see, man, as he said, well, go ahead. The Lord be with you. He reached down there and hunted him out in the old valley and got him five little rocks. And he put them in his little script bag. He put one down in his sling and walked out there to meet Goliath. Goliath looked at him and said, Am I a dog? Why, he cursed him in the name of his God. He said, I'll take you, you little weasley-looking holy roller, you, and stick this spear in you and hang you up there and let the birds eat on you for a while. Yes, sir. You say, David was the holy roller? Yes, he was. What you call a holy roller, when the ark of the Lord began to come in, he went out and danced before the ark just as hard as he could. And his wife made fun of him and said, Go like that, watch this. And down and around and around and around and around the ark he went again. If that ain't a modern holy roller, I've never seen one in my life. Sure you are. Someone said, Brother Branham, you got some of that there new kind of religion, haven't you? I said, No, I got a good dose of the old kind. Amen. Said, I said, I mean that shouting religion. I said, that's the oldest religion has ever known. I said, God asked Job, where was you when I laid the foundation of the world when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy 10,000 years before the world was ever formed? Oh. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Go to call me Holy Roller anyhow. I said, might as well get ready. <laughs> get used to it. <laughs> Notice, brother, let me tell you something. David knew. And he got that old slingshot wrapped up. And he went out and he said, you meet me as a Philistine. In the name of a Philistine, with an armor, with a spear. But I meet you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, of the very army that you defied. And said, This day I'll give your carcass to the birds and the animals of the field, and I'll take all the flesh of these Philistines. Now, and the old guy started at him. Now look at David, when he ran over this little brook, crossed over to meet him. And when he did, what did he have in his hand? Here's what David had he had five rocks. F-A-I-T-H in five fingers wrapped around J-E-S-U-S here he comes five rocks and five fingers faith in the Lord Jesus and that rock directed straight to the skull of that old giant and David down him and cut his head off and when he did he looked around and all the rest of them seeing what was done they took courage and drew their swords and began to fight for his knees to the wall cut them down here a few years ago when I first started it wasn't hardly anybody preaching on divine healing when they seen congressmen up showing and them healed, I tell you, Presbyterians and Methodists and uh, Assemblies of God and all of them, they got them one and the others got them one. The Church of God got them. Or Roberts and the other got somebody else. And brother, we've been cutting for this team from right to the left. Hallelujah, because every heart's taking courage tonight. And a half has never yet been told. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has promised. What is it in your hand tonight? Whatever you got, use it for the glory of God. I can see a fellow down there by the name of Samson. He got out there one day and the Philistines had done a little harm over there. Tied some foxes' tails together and burned up all their corn. So the Israelites come and got him and said, We got to deliver you up to the Philistines. And they took him over there and tied him with some bands and brought him down there. And the Philistines would go to mistreat him. And when he did, the Spirit of the Lord come on him. Amen. That's what made the difference. When he felt the Spirit of the Lord come on him, he didn't have nothing in his hand. He looked down and there laid a jawbone of a mule. And he picked up that jawbone in his hand and killed a thousand Philistines. Amen. Amen. That's all he had. He didn't have to go forward and say, Now wait, let me take this jawbone down and let me test it and see if it'll stand the pressure or not. He didn't have time to think of all those things. The emergency was on. The Philistines was on him. The only thing he could do is pick up a jawbone and fight. That's all there was. And tonight you ain't got time to run away and figure out all this stuff. The revival will be over tomorrow night. Let's pick up God's Word. That's in your hand. Let's fight. Amen. 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 God give him the victory. There's a little old fellow down there in the Bible by the name of Shamgar. Might not even never notice him in the book of Judges. Just a little old fellow. Let's take a little drama to him. I can see him over there. Poor little fellow. It's a time when everybody did what they wanted to. And Israel had no king. It was all separated, divided out, little groups, just about like the church is today. One's a assembly, the other's a church of God, the other's a oneness, the other's a Baptist, the other's a Presbyterian, one's a Methodist. Oh my, if you don't like to hear, we go over here and over here and over here and oh my. I, I, I don't get it myself. 
And then when they come in there, and oh, what they needed was, just what they needed then was a good old-fashioned kind of a liberation. It's what we need today. Amen. The church back to the faith of the living God, back to the promise of God, back to the glory of God, back to the power of God. Shamgar got all this stuff put up his wheat. Like he did every year, and by the time he get the crops put up, then along would come the Philistines and take it away from him. That's just the way the devil does. Just about what the devil's good for. Just about time you get a little courage built up or something or other, then along comes the devil and takes it away from you. That's right. Just like the revival that's going on now. Just about time you get it started and the glory of God begins to fall, then some quack has to come up and do something that's not right and take the glory out of the thing. Here not long ago, I went out and here was one of our Christian sisters, painted up like a Jezebel. And I said, what's the matter? She said, well, I'm going to God. I said, my pastor told me it's liberation of women. Liberation of women. What's the matter with you? No such a thing as that. Christ liberates you from sin and act like it and dress like it. About the time the church gets built up and get a good start, then something like that has to happen. Yes, sir. She said, well, I tell you, said, my pastor told me I could do all this and had enough paint on to paint a barn. Her finger looked like she'd been eating raw beef steak and blood over her fingernails. I thought, woman, you don't look like a Christian to me. Listen, lady, don't you let that kind of nonsense be poured down your throat. A good old-fashioned case of the baptism of the Holy Ghost will take that out of you just as that like. Right? Just remember, you've lost some ground somewhere. I don't care what that woman preacher, she wasn't ordained to God to tell you that in the first place. That's right. It's the contrary to the Word. Listen, there never was but one woman in the Bible that ever painted herself up to meet a man. And that was Jezebel. God fed her to the dogs. So if you see a woman all painted up, you say, how did you miss dog meat? That's what God made out of her. Just an old dog meat. So don't you pay any attention to that. That's the devil. Right? Worship and clean up and act like, like Jacob said to his wife and daughter. Make yourself like what you ought to be. Hey, man, what we need tonight is a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival preached back with the power of God moving in and out amongst the church and the starch and collars taken down. Hallelujah. Yes, sir, that's what we need. Yes, sir. All right. Old Shamgar down there, about time he got something built up, then something like that had to happen. That's the way the church, when the revival gets started, then something like that has to raise up. Brother, just preach the old-fashioned. Well, we used to have a lot of sheep in our country, and they had a sheep-killing dog. We caught him with the wool in his teeth. We took the old shotgun both barrels and turned it on him. Brother, that's the thing to turn on them kind of guys, is the old shotgun both barrels of it. Tell you to straighten things out, and sure will, it'll stop your sheep killing. <laughs> Amen! <laughs> I didn't know I was going to say that, but you can just remember that. All right. Think of it. My, and there, by the time he got his sweet in and everything, here come the big old fat Philistines up and take it away from him. I don't up the road, plank, take it away from him. One day he just got his crop all laid in it, all thrashed out. There he was, poor little fellow. He stood down there at the garner, was looking around. And he said, well, Mother, perhaps maybe we'll, we can live this winter. Us and the kiddies looking around. And the first thing you know, he had... Happen to hear something come up the road, chomp, 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 chomp. Here comes 600 armed men, big old brass helmets on, their big old iron shoes, their spears in their hand, their big swords hanging at their side, coming up the road, take his crop away from him. I can see a little sand guard say, oh my, look at there. Here it comes again. He looked over at his poor little wife. There she was, the elbows of her dress out. There's the little children look real skinny because they hadn't had nothing to eat. The Philistines had took it away. That's about like some of the Christians looking at a puny looking thing to be called a believer, a born again Christian. Amen. Amen. Not enough faith to dot an eye if it was ink. That's right. Oh my! Don't let the devil come over and take the glory of God out of the church. Send your pastor away. Let him get all these your DDs and come back and stand up and say amen like a dying calf. What you need is an old-fashioned backwood, sky blue, sin-killing religion of a preacher amen. that'll preach the truth and stand on what God said. Preach the truth and liberate the people. Amen. I'm not rude. I don't mean to be. But, brother, it's time we brought made black, black and white, white. Yes, sir, you'll get God in your camp. You'll hear the shout again in the camp of a king when you get the thing fixed up. Amen. Now notice. And here was a little old Shamgar standing looking out the window. Here come these Philistines. He said, oh, mother, look at there. This poor little girl crying. I can see her put her hands down and say, Daddy, we won't have nothing to eat this winter. 
And then I notice the mother, and there she starts crying. You know, Shandar looked around. He just didn't know what to do. He looked around. He said, I couldn't fight. I'm not a fighter. And I, I, I got time to go out and learn how to duel and take all these exercises and things. Uh, I, I haven't got time to do that. But he had looked set in the corner, and there stood an old ox goad. <laughs> you know what an ox goad is? It's a big old stick with a brass end on it to knock the... Uh, punch the cattle through the gate with one thing and knock the dirt off the flower when there's plowing with it. An old ox goat laying there. That's the only thing that he could put in his hand. But you know what? I don't say he got angry, but his righteous indignation got up. <laughs> yes, sir. Brother, I tell you, he got... What's in your hand? Nothing but an ox goat. And he said, I'm not a fighter. I, I can't do this. I, I haven't got any training. But he didn't have time to do any training. The only thing he needed was the Spirit of God on him. He jumped out that window with the Spirit of God on him and took that ox goat and killed 600 Philistines. Amen. Amen. What we need today is not go away to seminary and learn whether Mark 16 is right or not. But if people are dying, the thing we've got to do is get out right now. It ain't whether you're a dude or not. It's rise. Yes, sir. He knew that he was a Philistine. He knew that I was Philistines uncircumcised. As sure as I know that sickness, as long as you know you've got heart trouble, whatever your trouble is, we know it's of the devil. And he knew that he was an Israelite. He knew that he was circumcised. He knew he had a right to the promise. He knew that God would promise to bless him. So he got all angry with it and picked up the ox gold and went to work. What we need tonight is to believe, my brother, that you are God's child and you got a right to it and the promise is yours. Whatever's in your hand, pick it up and go to slaying the devil from one side to the other. Amen. And you'll find out that the feathers will go to fly and the devil will be defeated and you'll come forth whole again. What's that in your hand? You say, Brother Brown, ain't got nothing in my hand. You might have a prayer card. Drop the thing on the ground and rise in the name of Jesus Christ and say, I'll take Christ as my healer today. Hallelujah. You may have a little catechism sticking on your arm and want to check up on me to see if I'm right now. Pull the thing away and rise in the name of Jesus Christ and get baptized with the Holy Ghost and go forth Amen. in the can. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir, you might have a bunch of little creeds you have to repeat in the morning before you go to church and learn them so you can say, throw the thing away and get a filling of the heart of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Drop the thing and take what's in your hand. Whatever's in your hand, take it and do the best you can with it for the glory of God. Amen. My goodness, I sure this at 10 o'clock nearly. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, there isn't much in our hand, but God, it isn't what's in our hand. It's what you can put in our hand. Oh, God, we need faith tonight. Take this little message tonight, Lord, and put it in the heart of every believer. And let them know that no matter how weak the person is, they still have Christ at hand. And I ask that you will grant these blessings. Save the lost. Fill with the Holy Ghost those who are outside of Christ. And get glory out of the service. In Jesus' name I ask it. With your heads bowed, I wonder why we make this altar call just a moment. I know this is old-fashioned, rough, scoured down, scaled out preaching. Sass for ass as it can be. But, brother, you need it sometime. That's right, you need it. Now, I wonder if there's anybody here tonight, not with some pathetic story, to cry and go on. Listen, there'll be more people deceived on that than anything I know of. I'm not going to heaven because my mother went there. I'm going because Jesus Christ died that I could go there. I want to see my mother, sure. But I've got to come to Christ, not because my mother went, but because I come as a sinner and confess my sin except God's provided way. That's right. Now, are you tonight saying, I am a sinner, preacher, and I want you to remember me in prayer. I'll raise up my hand to you to ask that you'll remember me in prayer as a sinner. Will you put your hands up anywhere in the audience? God bless you all around. My, my, my. Way up in the ring around the balconies, anywhere up in there. Yes, I see your hands all the way around. God sees them too. Certainly he does. Immediately after this service, I want you to come down here and make a confession. Give your heart to Christ and serve the Lord with all your heart. Heavenly Father, as the night is growing on, little sick children sitting around, I pray, dear God, that your mercies will be shed abroad in our hearts just now. May this little text of 
What is that in your hand? To Moses, nothing but a dry stick. To David, nothing but two little strings with a piece of leather in it, a slingshot. To Samson, nothing but a dry bone of a mule's jaw. Oh, God. Shamgar, not, nothing but an ox goat in his hand, a stick with a little piece of brass on the end of it, and he slew 600 Philistines. Not a warrior, not a fighter, but a man in the covenant. Oh, Heavenly Father, won't you tonight, Lord, take each one into your hand, grant it, Lord, and open faith to their heart, and may Thy Holy Spirit do the exceedingly abundantly tonight, Lord, as they're waiting last night, so happy to see you make the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the sinners to come to Thee. And, oh, God, all these great things that You did, the paralyzed, the untwist and come out of them chairs, walk around in the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord God, You're great, and we thank Thee for it. And we pray that You'll save every one tonight who put up their hands. May they never be lost, but may this be the night that they'll receive You. Literally a hundred or two put up their hands, and I pray that you'll save every one of them for Jesus' sake. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. He sent a million Bibles down to these Jews that just come in from down Aram and, and down in the countries there. You read it, read it in the magazines how they brought in millions of Jews. We had time to go into that prophetic thing. And those Jews coming back, I've got a picture of them coming in there. We're talking, coming off of ships, coming off of planes, packing their lame and their halt and their blind. So we walked up to him. The man had taken this picture, Brother Oregon Brighton, them, which is to be here in a meeting. He asked them, he said, what are you all coming back for? It's the homeland. He said, so that you can uh, have a place of your own to die in the homeland. He said, no, we're coming back to see the Messiah. Oh, you prophecy teachers, if you only knew how that was. When this gospel ever turns from the Gentile to the Jew, the Gentile is finished. It's the end time. And so they gave them Bibles. They sent a million in there. Those Jews begin to read those Testaments. They read it over. They never know Jesus this year. They never heard anything about it. Been down there since a Babylonian caraway captivity. And they said, if this Jesus you call be the Messiah... Let us see him do the sign of the prophet like he did here in this Bible, and we'll accept him. We'll all accept him. If he'll come and do the sign of a prophet, we'll accept him. Brother, oh my, I was in a couple hundred miles of it a few weeks ago, but the Holy Spirit constrained me, not just yet. Oh, how I would like to grow out a few million of them and say, I challenge that in the name of the Lord Jesus. If he won't do the sign of the prophet, how many of you here on this same ground will accept him as personal Savior? And then when they do that, I say, this same ground right here is where your early fathers received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the same signs that Jesus done will repeat again just exactly like you read in the Bible. They don't want to have... Their God's a powerful God. Their God don't die. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And they believe it. Notice... When Jesus was here on earth, he did not claim to be a healer. Many people come to him and didn't get healed. Many times, perhaps, he's taken to the dead. I imagine his thousands died while he was here on earth. He never raised but three. That's a confirmation. He passed through the pool of Bethesda where people were laying lame, halt, blind, and withered. Never healed a one of them. Went over to a man, laid on a pallet, and healed him. Walked away and left the rest of them laying there. A man full of virtue, full of faith. God Himself, Emmanuel, here on earth, dwelling among us. He said, I do nothing of myself. When they questioned Him in St. John 5, 19, He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in Himself but what He sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Now chase His life through the Bible and find out if it wasn't every time what the Father showed Him. Jesus said, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. When Philip got converted, went and found Nathaniel, brought him back, what happened? He said, come see who we f I found, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. He said, could anything good come out of Nazareth? When he come to see Jesus, he walked up in the line, about like out there. Jesus looked at him. He might have been the prayer line for all I know. But he come to where Jesus was, praying for the sick. He said to him, when he looked at him, Jesus looked over at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. 
And well, he said, how'd you know me, Rabbi? Astonished him. Well, he said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. He said, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. He went up through the way of Samaria. He was going to Jericho, but went up around Samaria, way up over the hill. He sat down and sent his disciples away. A Samaritan woman come out. He seen her there drawing water. The father had told him to go up there. He didn't tell him what was going to happen. He just go up there. So he got the woman up there and he said, bring me a drink. She said, it's not customary for Jews to ask Samaritans such. We have no dealing. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. What did he do? Kept carrying a conversation until he caught her spirit. Then when he caught her spirit, what was wrong with her? He said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. He said, you said, well, for you got five, and the one you have now is not yours. She said, I perceive that you're a prophet. She said, now, I know when Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city and said, come see a man that told me everything I ever done. Isn't this the Messiah? Now, if that Jesus is the same Jesus today, he can do the same thing today, and as God reveals, he can do the same thing. Is that right? Now, look here last night. There was men and women sitting around in this row here, paralyzed, sitting in wheelchairs. Tonight, they're out there in a congregation wherever they are walking around. Why? Jesus Christ. There was men and women come to the platform, sin in their life. The Holy Spirit went right down, tell them just what it was and what they must do. They were healed, standing right there on the platform, give their hearts to Christ. If that isn't Jesus Christ of the Bible, I don't know the Bible. What about it, ministers? Does that sound like Christ of the Bible? Now, it isn't man. It's Christ. Now, if he will return tonight here and produce the same thing that he did when he was here on earth, will you all accept him then as Savior, as healer, and believe him with all your heart? If you will, will you raise your hand? God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, now it's... This is all I know to do. The rest is to Thee, my dear beloved Savior. And I pray that You'll grant the blessings through Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we took up all the prayer cards last night. I believe they give out some new ones today. If the boy, I see you here a while ago. And um, what were O's? All right. Let's start and line up some of them then. Uh, who has number one? Oh, look at your uh, prayer card and you'll find it. If you are, you may come over. Is this lady here? Oh, yes. Um, just come up, lady, right here. It's kind of a little difficult. I'll probably have to call just one or two. Who has O number two? Would you raise up your hand, Ever who has number two? The lady back there, would you come? Lady, if you will. Who has O number three? Would you raise up your hand, Ever who has O number three? Would you raise your hand? Back here, sir. Sorry. All right. Would you come up there? Number two and number three. Now, number four. Who has O number four? Would you raise your hand? You, sir. Would you come down here? All right. Number five. Who has O number five? You have it, lady. Would you come down here? Number six. Who has number six? Would you raise your hand? Number six. Some of you. Uh, oh, sure. Come here and catch these here in these chairs. All right. That's fine. All right. Number, what was I, five? Who, six? Who has seven? Prayer card seven. Would you raise your hand? Right, seven, the lady there. Eight. Would you raise your hand quickly? Eight, nine. Would you raise your hand right away? Nine. All right. Ten. And now as they line up. Now, how many in this audience around everywhere now? I want to ask you. Now, this old-fashioned, sass preaching may be rough as it can be, but, brother, that's all I know. That's what saved me. And that's all I know. I, uh, all I know, I don't want to offend you, but I sure would rather offend you a little now to get you right with God and know I have to stand up that day and you point your finger in my face and say, why didn't you tell me the truth? See, I'd rather have it fixed up now, wouldn't you? All settled. Now, how many here doesn't have a prayer card and wants to be prayed for? Would you raise up your hand? Just raise up your hand. Don't have a prayer card, but yet you believe that God would heal you. May the Lord Jesus in His mercy ever bless you. 
All right. Now, if we'll just be reverent for a few moments. Let's see if they're like... Well, that worry about as funny as you can get in that line, I suppose. All right. We'll pray for a few right here now, and then the, we'll wait just a, a little bit to see wherever the, our precious Heavenly Father will lead. Now, I want you to believe with all your heart. I see a man's going to reach for... Is that your girl, is it? A man's got so much faith, he's got a little poly old girl sitting here. When this prayer line begins to start, he reaches over and takes a big brace and shoe off his child. That's the way. That's the way. Mm. That's, that's faith. That's the way to believe it. Our loving Savior knows all things, can do all things. Now, along this prayer line here, just a few, maybe we can stand up a few more in a moment. I want to ask you along there, are you all strangers to me in the prayer line? If you are, raise your hand. All of you strangers. Are you all strangers out there? Raise your hands. Everywhere in the, is all strangers. Then I don't know you. I know nothing of you. But I want to ask you something. Just make this just on the Bible. Now, what if Jesus was standing here wearing this suit that he gave me? Now, what, what if he was standing here? What would he do with this situation tonight? What if, uh, if uh, someone out there would come and say, uh, Jesus, will you heal me? You know what he'd say to you? He'd say, I've already done it. Don't you believe it? Is that right? What he'd done at Calvary, he can't do no more. See, he, he healed you at Calvary. He saved you at Calvary. Now, you say, I was saved two years ago, Brother Branham. Well, you wasn't saved. Two, you were saved 1,900 years ago. You accepted it two years ago. Jesus paid for your sins when he died at Calvary. He paid for your sickness when he died at Calvary. So, therefore, if God in his mercy did that, the only thing he could do now would either pick up the Bible, preach the Word, or he might be able to speak with a language that would be interpreted by somebody else and tell somebody something to do. Or, he being the prince of prophets, he could perhaps stand here like he did in the Bible time, and your faith could come over and touch him till virtue would go out of him, and he'd turn around and say, Who touched me? And he'd look around and tell you just exactly what happened. Is that right? Amen. That's Jesus. Then if this lady sitting here in the chair would come up here and... Jesus would know her. I don't know her. God knows that. I've never seen her in my life. But what I'm trying to get at you, friends, so you'll always remember, now when Jesus did those things, what did Philip say he was? The Son of God. What did the woman say he was? The very Messiah, because he did it. But what did the Jews say he was? Say he's a fortune teller. He's the devil. He's Beelzebub, the prince of all the fortune tellers. See, they know he knew what was wrong with them. He knew their hearts. He knew their troubles. For the Father showed him what he wanted him to know. You see what I mean? Now, that's Jesus tonight, the same. All right. Now, be reverent wherever you are. And uh, this ought to settle it once forever. Would you bring that lady here or tell her come here? Come here. I just, now, lady, I just want you to stand there. That's all to do, just that's all I ask you to do, just stand there. Uh, I don't know you. You don't know me. You just raise your hands. You didn't know me, and I don't know you. But God knows both of us, sister. And he, um, and he, uh, I hesitate about that sister for a minute, you see, to say that, but I realize now you are. Now, see, it's first, first thing I know that you're a Christian because as soon as I caught your spirit, it come in like that, that you was a Christian. See, your spirit was welcome. If it kept turning dark and cloudy, I knowed you wasn't, see? And therefore, I wouldn't have called you my sister. So then, but you are a Christian. Now, that much, now that's, now that's just what Philip said to Nathaniel. When he came up, he said, Behold, an Israelite, or a believer, in whom is no guile. He said, How'd you know I was an Israelite, a true believer? See, that's the same spirit. That woman could have been a rank sinner, but I know she's a Christian, see? Because the first thing, her spirit, when this anointing that's here now, it caught right quick, you see. I seen it was a Christian. It made it welcome, see. 
though she, I know she's a Christian. Now, if I don't know the woman, she don't know me. If the Holy Spirit will reveal to her what she's here for. Now, of course, the longer I talk to her, more it would say, you know that night after night. But if it would just tell her what she's here for, would the whole group of you believe that I've told the truth? That'd be God saying it's the truth. Now, a man can come by here and tell you anything in the world, make up some kind of fanaticism, do anything he wants to. That, he can do that, tell you that. That don't make it so. But when God comes back around and says that's the truth, then you better believe it. Because uh, not to believe that is sin. So I've testified. Now it's God's time to testify whether I've told the truth or not. All right. Now I just stand here talking to the lady. Never seen her in my life. But the lady's very conscious right now that something is near her that isn't her brother here, a man. A something near her that she knows it is. And that's that angel right there you see on the picture. It's right here now. Just a light between me and the woman. That's the reason it dropped down there and I felt it welcome. Light all the way through. She's a Christian. Now, I just want to talk to you just a moment for you being the first patient. And I want every person, no matter where you are and what's wrong with you, you look this away and you say, Now, Lord Jesus, if you, I know that man up there, he's just a man. And if, and if you just let me, let me have faith and let my faith be built just to the place like the lady will be. And then watch what God will do. And then you accept him as your healer, as your savior, whatever you have need of. Now to talk to you, lady, there's people from here all around tonight. I've just got to single you out, spirits from everywhere. Now, me being just a man, then you just a woman, it's the very same kind of a picture that Jesus talking to a woman at the, at the well. It's a man and a woman again. I, I don't know you and never seen you, but I just have to get your spirit different from these other spirit of people who's talking or who's try, praying, you know, at this time, faith coming in. But immediately, now if the audience is still hearing my voice, the lady's moving away from me. And she's, she's a lady. That woman he's standing before me has just recently been in a hospital. And that's just been an hours ago. She was just dismissed from the hospital today or this afternoon, seven o'clock tonight. Oh, Jesus. When she, comes oh, to the hospital. Jesus. she has a rare blood disease, oh, but with a mental Jesus. nervous condition. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Go on your road, sister. Your Jesus. faith heals you and you make yourself well. Amen. Amen. You believe? Yeah. All your heart now. Have faith. Don't doubt. <laughs> if thou canst believe, all things are possible. But you've got to believe. I just have faith out there, and you shall have what you ask for. A little lady sitting there in a pink coat with that bladder trouble just You've been healed. God bless you. <laughs> Lay your hand over on the lady next to you because she suffers with a nervous condition on this side over there. Our Heavenly Father, her faith touched. I got weak. I seen the light of you hanging over. I pronounce them well in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. See, you don't need prayer cards. You have faith, believe that God has said truth, for he's nothing but truth. He's the resource of all truth. Now, just be reverent. Just believe with all your heart. You, should, you can have what you, what you ask for if you'll just believe it. Now, is this, this is the patient. I'm not beside myself, but... The world will never know, sister, what a feeling it is. Now, are we do, do not know each other. We're strange to each other. And I am your brother in the Lord Jesus, and we are here trying to help one another. If I could, if I could help you and wouldn't do it, I'd be a brute if I could help you. 
but there's nothing in me that I could help except God would let me know what to do. So if he will reveal to me why you're standing here, will you accept it then as truth? If it's finances or whatever it is, you believe that God is interested in your case and it's going to hear. You'll do it. And may the Lord grant it. It's my prayer. As you look at me, not, you know, like Peter and John passed through the gate called Buell said, look on us. Look on us. Not look to them as him, but just to give attention to what they're saying. Catch the attraction of the Spirit. I see that you had some trouble with the uh, eyes condition. And I see a doctor that's examining it, and he consulted another man. And that man, they don't know what's wrong with your eye. Amen. They can't say, they can't put their hand on it, what it is. Amen. That's the truth. And then I see him giving you some kind of a, something down in the stomach here or something. It's a fallen stomach. Amen. You have a fallen stomach. All my life. The doctors has give you up in them regard. That's right. One doctor and you are me not it. from, One. you're not from this city. No. You come from a, up the road this way. Amen. Atlanta. That's right. And the doctor said, Miss Curdy, you're something like that, he called you. Yes. That's right. That's right. You return home now and be well. Amen. Your faith Amen. makes you well. Amen. God bless you. Have faith. You're the father of the child. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. But believe. If thou canst believe. Now remember, this is not me. Here to it, it's not. Now your attitude towards it, call it what you wish to, that'll determine what you get from it. Depends on how you approach it. The woman touched his garment. She had virtue come to her. The man who smacked him on the face and hit him with the reed and said, prophesy and say who hit you. There is no virtue to that. Little lady sitting right back there, you're suffering with head trouble, aren't you, lady? <coughs> sitting looking at me right there. You believe Je Yes, ma'am. You believe Jesus will heal you? He did heal you right then. You're, you suffered with that for a long time, lady. It's gone from you now. Your faith made you whole. Praise be to the living God. Oh, how we love Him. How you should love Him. While the Holy Spirit's are moving there, there's a man sitting right behind you, sitting there with an arthritis. You believe, sir, that the Lord Jesus will make you well? You believe it? Yes, sir. You do? All right, sir. You can have your healing then. God bless you. Kind of shocks you, doesn't it? The lady's sitting right back there holding her hand up praying. She's got a bladder trouble. She wants to be healed too, looking right at me, sitting right back in the back. You believe that God will heal you back there, lady? All right. If you believe it, you can have your healing. Amen. Isn't he marvelous? Lady sitting right back here, right back through here. She's looking right at me. I see the light hanging right over. She doesn't have a prayer card. But she's suffering with a heart trouble and arthritis. That light went right straight from this man over to her. Right through here. And now, sister, if you want to bleed with all your heart, you're wearing glasses, you want to bleed, you can be healed. Jesus Christ will make you well. God bless you. All right, that settles it. <laughs> Amen. Oh, how wonderful. Do you believe? Now here, it looks like you can see that Christian friend. See that light whirling? It's standing right here. It's coming right over that, light, sitting right there. you got the Vericoyus veins sitting right there. You believe Jesus is going to make you well with those veins, heal you? You believe it with all your heart? If you do, you can have your healing. God bless you. Excuse me, sir. You believe me to be his servant? 
You come with your baby, mighty sweet little baby. I don't know you. You know that. I'm a total stranger to you. I've never seen you, I suppose, in my life, sir. We are totally strange to each other. But God knows both of us, doesn't he, sir? You got your little baby, and I can see that baby coming from being examined, and the doctor says there's no hope for it. That baby is suffering with cancer in the blood called leukemia. That's right. There's not a hope in the world for it. And my brother, the father of that baby, you need the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't you? You're a sinner. Will you accept him now as your Savior? You, will you raise your hand and say, Lord, I accept you? Now put your hand right over on your baby. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I now rebuke this devil that's killing this baby. May pardon and grace come to this father, and may they go and live and be happily together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Your sins are gone. Have faith in God now. Amen. <clears throat> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can be made well. You believe in? What do you think, sir? You believe me as God's servant? Your trouble is in your back. It's a spinal condition. It's right, isn't it? You're having hopes tonight that you can get saved in another thing. You've got a habit you want deliverance from, isn't it? Smoking cigarettes. Will you give them up right now? Raise your hand and say, God, this finishes it. On your road and your back trouble will be well. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's say praise be to God. Death lingers near, so does life. Do you believe that Christ could heal you this horrible demon? Do you believe he'll take it away from you and make you well of this cancer? Almighty God, the author of life, the giver of every good gift, send thy blessings upon the woman and heal her in Jesus' name, I pray. Satan, I rebuke thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Go on your road rejoicing now. Just a minute. What do you think, sir, sitting here in a wheelchair? Are you believing? You believe Jesus will make you well? Kind of struck you then, didn't it? You realize something happened. You believe me to be a servant? Will you obey me as his prophet? Then you can get up out of your wheelchair and push it and go home. Jesus Christ will make you well. Don't be scared. Believe. And the rest of you, while he's coming out, you can do the very same thing. There he is. Let's, you don't want to stand up? Every one of you stand to your feet right at this time. Almighty God, author of life, giver of every good gift, send thy spirit upon these people and heal them every one. Satan, I condemn thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come out of this people. Every one of you stand to your feet everywhere and give God praise. The Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise him. 